I'm delighted to have the opportunity to participate in the 2013 uh, Global Scholars uh, Summit, and I'm grateful to my friend uh, Kyle Edwards for the opportunity to join you today. I think that the work of the summit is terribly important, so I'm especially honored, really, to have the uh, opportunity to join. I want to talk a bit about religious freedom and the promotion of the great human right of religious liberty around the world. We live, I uh, regret to say, in an era of religious persecution. Uh, we find this across the globe. Sometimes it's members of one religion persecuting members of another religion. Sometimes it's secular people being persecuted by religious people. Sometimes it's religious people being persecuted by secular uh, people. But religious persecution in any form against anyone is deeply wrong and a violation of a very fundamental human right, the right to religious liberty, what we sometimes and quite rightly call our first freedom. How then should we go about protecting and advancing and promoting the right to religious liberty, looking forward now uh, to uh, uh, the future of the 21st century? Well, I think the key is to promote religious understanding promote understanding among people of different faiths and between people of faith and people who have not found their way to faith, secular people. Uh, this is entirely compatible, I would insist, with firm conviction all around. The right to religious liberty doesn't depend on people adopting an attitude of religious indifferentism or religious relativism or believing that all religions are equally true or all religions are equally false or anything like that. One can have one's own convictions. One can believe uh, profoundly in the teachings of one's own faith while recognizing those of a different faith as nevertheless fellow strivers for truth and for goodness and for right. People who are on the spiritual quest just as we are. We needn't agree with their conclusions in every respect in order to respect their striving and where possible, and this will be widely possible, uh, respect their acting on their own religiously inspired convictions, not only in their own synagogues or churches or mosques or other houses of worship, not merely in their homes where they might uh, uh, say the prayers that are specified uh, by the faith, but also in the public square. Religious freedom is a robust right. It's not a narrow right to the private practice of one's religion. Religious freedom in its robust sense is the right to go into the public square, make one's religious arguments, make one's religious claims, celebrate one's religious faith consistently with respect for the rights of others, but even to bring one's faith into the public square and vie for the allegiance of one's fellow citizens to make uh, the case to bring one's religiously inspired moral convictions about justice and the common good into the public square, just as the abolitionists did, just as Dr. Martin Luther King and Reverend Ralph Abernathy and the other leaders of the Civil Rights Movement did, again, in the effort to persuade one's fellow citizens of the justice of one's cause. We can do that. We can do that in every nation and among every people in a way that is consistent with our religious convictions, with our firm beliefs. You know, our most immediate experience as human beings is the experience, the, the experience of ourselves as free and rational creatures. That is, as agents, as beings who cause things that we're not caused to cause. If freedom and rationality, fundamental metaphysical freedom, freedom of the will and rationality, are more than merely illusions, then they're not reducible to material causes that determine uh, what we do, leaving us with the mere illusory experience of freedom. But if that's true, there's a very profound sense in which we are spiritual creatures, and our first experience is, our, is of ourselves as spiritual creatures. Our most immediate experience, I mean by first experience, our most immediate experience is of ourselves as spiritual creatures. And I think this is what gives rise to the religious quest, the ubiquity of religion, the quest for spiritual truth. And in that sense, all of us, even those who do not believe, are looking for the truth. We're spiritual questers. We're seekers. 
Uh, some of us believe that we have found in one or the other of the great traditions of faith or in perhaps some small uh, faith that, that we ourselves have founded or become part of, we've found uh, truth in its fullness, or at least we're on the way to truth in its fullness. Uh, that's fine. That's good. The point of, the point of uh, seeking truth is to, is to find it. And when, when one thinks one has found it, one should act on it. But one must act on it in a way that respects the rights of one's fellow seekers of truth. To go on that journey, to be on that journey, to change their minds, to consider other possibilities. And that's what respect for religious freedom means, which means it necessarily includes the right to change one's religions. So when the force of law is used to oppress a religious point of view, uh, or by a religious majority to oppress a secular point of view, a real wrong is done to the quester, to the person who's seeking uh, the truth. The right to religious liberty must mean the right to change one's religion, to move from one faith to another faith, or from a position of secularism to a position of faith, or from a position of faith to a position of secularism. And as I said at the beginning, throughout the world, alas, today, we find uh, oppression of all sorts by religious people of secular people, by secular people of religious people, by some religious people of other religious people. But within all the great traditions of faith, there are resources for the strong philosophical and theological defense of a robust conception of religious freedom. In every faith there is a recognition that true faith must be free, that a coerced faith is not really faith at all. It can't be faith. After all, what can government or force coerce except the outward manifestations of faith? It cannot coerce the inward acts of intellect and will that constitute true faith true belief. So within each of the great religious traditions, that insight can be the foundation for developing a truly robust and fruitful understanding of religious freedom. And from that understanding, I think we can move from a world of religious persecution to a world of mutual respect. And that really should be one of our central goals. You scholars, as you are looking forward to your own lives and careers, to the contributions that uh, you might make uh, to the good of your nations and to the good of the world, should bear in mind, among the other important values, religious liberty and the religious understanding on which a firm uh, ground for religious liberty is formed. Again, I wish you the very best in this meeting and in your deliberations, and thank you for giving me the opportunity